Well, John's Gospel has everybody running. <laughs> right? Um, Mary finds that empty too, and she runs to tell Peter and John. And then, boom! <coughs> they run back, running together like a race. You know, who can run faster? So, uh, did you run here this morning? <laughs> did you? No. You just get up out of bed and go, I gotta get to church. Anybody out of breath? Did you drive here with quick anticipation of that? Breaking all speed limits? Well, did you come with questions? Or did you come with exclamations? Which? Did, did you come with doubts or proclamations? Hearts full of hope or minds full of confidence? Did you come to hear the old story or did you come to hear something new? Did you come to hear an answer to the question is it true? Is any of it true? Is it true that God lives and gives us life? Did God create the world with an established routine, with physical laws, only to break them. <laughs> you know, I have to think that Easter is not a day for beginners. It's a day that is preceded by some pretty harsh realities. There was the violence of the crucifixion itself and the suffering that our Lord endured until his last words, it is finished. Into your hands I commend my spirit. And before that, there were those betrayals. The betrayals by Judas, who brought the enemy right to him. And Peter, who denied him. And those crowds, just last Sunday, Hosanna, 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 waving their palms, Hosanna. And then, just Friday, waving their fists, crucify him, crucify him. How long did that take? And on Saturday, everyone huddled away in grieving and fear-filled sorrow. Easter morning, this is when the story begins. Now Jesus told them he would die and rise again. But once he was arrested, nailed to the cross, and laid in the tomb, the realities of the physical world overcame them, completely overcame them. They didn't think that what he said to them could be true. But Mary discovered that it was true in that garden. And first she saw the angels, the messengers. And then she saw the stranger. And I love that part. It's my favorite part. She looks right at Jesus, and she does not recognize. I mean, don't kid yourself. It's not, it doesn't say he's, you know, some mystical thing, you know, fluttering or anything like that. She should have been able to recognize him. Later on, the others will see him and they'll recognize him. It's, and it's not because they're wiser than she was. It's that they have a little preparation. Just, she just looks right at him. She's, she's not prepared. 
The idea that Jesus is alive is still too new, too impossible, too untrue for her. She can't believe her eyes. She even argues with him, doesn't she? She argues with him. Uh, she says, in case he's the one who has taken her Lord, she says, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will go put him in his proper resting place. I imagined her to be a small woman. Well, I don't know why. I just do. But she must have been fiercely brave to have taken on two angels and a strange man <laughs> by herself to carry the body of Jesus back to the rightful resting place. Can you imagine the, the fortitude of this one? She was impressive, but yet she doesn't believe that he's risen. Until he uses her name, until he says, Mary. I wonder, when was the last time he had said her name to her? Was it, was it on Thursday, maybe? The day of the Last Supper? Just a few days before? The memory of his voice would still be so clear in her mind. We can remember a loved one's voice for a while, clearly in our minds. And that's all she needed, and she knew this was Jesus. That was all Mary needed to believe. As Christ told her to do, then she went and she told the others. And eventually they told the world about Jesus. But here's the interesting thing for us. When we think of telling the story of Jesus, what do we tell? Where do we start the story? We usually start often with Christmas. Hmm? Uh, candles, soft lights, beans, angels, gentleness, quiet. Or sometimes we talk about Jesus' stories and his teaching. Or his signs and miracles. And they're good choices, I'm not saying there's, they're bad choices. But the early church only talked about Easter. That's all they talked about when they told people about Jesus. Christ crucified and Christ risen. That was the gospel. Easter is the beginning. It may be the hardest part, but it's the most important part. Easter is the most important part for the church. But we are so like dear Mary in that garden. You know, we identify trouble. And we see a problem like Mary did. You know, Jesus' body was missing. <coughs> And instantly, we are sure we understand the whole thing. We got it right away. And we know how to fix it. And we are all over it. We understand the problem and we know how to fix it. Only we're so busy knowing what we know. We don't recognize Jesus standing right in front of us with a whole new possibility with a whole new world, a whole new vision ready to go. Do you understand what I'm saying? Sometimes we're so completely narrow in what we know that we miss the fact that Jesus is standing right there in front of us with a whole new world of possibility. How many mistakes do we make that way in our lives? So Mary runs to get help, and all three disciples run back, and Mary discovers that her friends aren't as much help as she thought they'd be, right? 
One's too afraid to even look. The other one looks and goes, whoop, 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 and runs back. Big help in her. And so she's alone there in the garden. And in sorrow, she finds herself miscommunicating with angels and arguing with the Savior himself. I mean, that's what happens in that story. You see, she knew what she knew, and there wasn't room for God to work a change in her thinking. So she keeps pushing, intent on her own agenda, and she says, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will bring him back. She's feisty, even if she's wrong. <laughs> She stays in the struggle, and that's her strength, even if she doesn't remember his teaching from before or entertain the vast power of the Savior she knew or trust in the promises he made to them. She at least stays in the struggle. She doesn't run back to the hidden room upstairs, unfortunately. It's a struggle to fix things the wrong way. Now think about it. Just think about what she wanted to do. Her goal to make things right is to put Jesus back in the tomb. Right? That's really what she wants to do. She can't accept the fact that Jesus has risen from the dead, that God is powerful enough to accomplish such a thing, even though God promised that that's exactly what would happen. And so Mary is intent on putting Jesus back in the tomb. The only one of all of those disciples brave enough to stay in the struggle. And that's what she wants to do. Well, how about us? Sometimes that's exactly what we're trying to do. Take the magic and the mystery out of what God can actually accomplish and tidy it up. Her thinking is earthbound, and our thinking, too, is sometimes very earthbound. But this is God. This is our Savior. And our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ does not scold Mary for being faithless, for forgetting the three times he told them how all of this would unfold. Jesus does not leave her there alone, sorrowful, and confused in the garden. He speaks to her with kindness and compassion and love. He says her name, just her name. And that's enough to penetrate her barrier of disbelief. He says, Mary. And suddenly, suddenly, there wasn't any problem to fix. Right? The problem was solved. There was a new mission. She and the others now needed to tell the others about Jesus. To tell the others about this man sent from God, crucified, died, and risen from the grave. This one that God altered the rules of creation to redeem. You know, there's so much that goes wrong in this world. There are so many problems that need to be fixed. And some wrongs we can do something about as individuals or sometimes together as churches or countries or agencies. But often we're too concerned with fixing for the sake of fixing. If we just consider the important things, poverty, hunger, violence, climate change, 
terrorism. Like Mary in the garden, we want to fix things. But complicated things need greater wisdom, not just easy fixes that we can do quickly. And we people of faith might do well to first consider where the teaching of our faith directs us to go. What wisdom do we already have that can guide us before we act? Then, if we still think fixing is the best plan, maybe we should listen to see if we can hear our name being said softly in love, kindly and compassionately. If we hear our names, perhaps like Mary, we might even think a little longer and think, is our fix pointing the world towards the risen Christ and a new creation? Or is the fix turning us backward? Our fix? Our nation's fix? Any fix? Is the fix turning us backward toward pre-resurrection days of violence and betrayal? Does our solution shine a light of alleluia on a problem? Or does it bring a dark, self-defeating silence? Well, Mary heard her name because out of love, Jesus spoke. Christ is present with us here and now. Everywhere we are in everything we do, as a quiet observer or an active participant, however we invite Jesus in. But it's Easter. Let us run to the empty tomb to celebrate a God who can fix anything, who can even raise Jesus from the dead. Let us as disciples consider what we should do to help in creating a new creation, one where Christ has the glory and the power and the solution. And we work to provide willing hands and fleet feet to run to those in need. Amen. Amen.